Good afternoon. I want to thank the members of the Admatech Foundation for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, here's a, an autopsy specimen from an individual who died of Alzheimer's disease, not known to have prostate cancer, but you see here on this side of the prostate, there is a cancer which is clinically not apparent. Uh, I took this uh, took this specimen in order to show the anatomic relationship to the rectum, to the prostate, the neurovascular bundle on either side, and the non-VA fascia, which is this delicate marble fibro adipose tissue. Uh, and you can see when prostate cancer spreads outside the prostate, it goes along nerves. So it heads posterior laterally rather than directly into the rectum. Uh, so that uh, has been known for years and is very unusual for a prostate cancer when it gets advanced to actually involve the rectum. Now, this is a uh, radical prostatectomy a number of years ago. You can see the very large, uh, these were 14 gauge needle biopsy, two on each side that were done before the biopsy needle. Uh, this man had a huge amount of BCH, probably over 100 grams, and he also had, uh, as it turns out, a cancer in this purple zone here and a mirror image cancer on the other side. This cancer was already advanced. It was, had some Gleason pattern 4 elements which were already outside the prostate. But notice how it hits this surgical capsule, the condensed fibrous tissue separating the transition zone from the purple zone, uh, and this served as a barrier. So. What does that mean? So this man could have had a nucleation prostatectomy uh, where this was just popped out along the surgical capsule. You might examine 100 grams of tissue and find no cancer and conclude that this man was cancer-free when in fact he had a potentially life-threatening cancer. Uh, here's another whole mount section and corresponding uh, image of the microscopic uh, uh, here and the actual growth specimen. Uh, you can see this is a rather large cancer encompassing essentially all of the peripheral zone on this side and also in the transition zone. Sometimes cancer will grow from one zone to another when they get very, very large like this one. Uh, notice on the left, on the patient's right side, which is the left side of the screen here on the growth specimen, you see why it's difficult to, to image the transition zone because there's so much heterogeneity. You see a sponginess here of a BPH nodule, larger cystic area than this one. And this one looks very similar to the cancer on the other side. And in fact, all three of those are BPH nodules. And you see one, one here corresponding to the fibrous looking one and these other two here. Now, historically, of course, the only way to detect prostate cancer was the digital rectal examination. And that changed with the advent of PSA testing in the 80s and uh, also the ease of biopsy with the, uh, with the 18 gauge biopsy needle that made accession or accessibility of the prostate to extensive sampling a reality that along with ultrasound guidance, which is shown here. This is an early ultrasound from the 80s, low resolution, uh, but shows a prostate cancer here. Here's the uh, Viru, the reach for a little bit of BPH or not much. Uh, but this gentleman uh, had a digital rectal exam and no cancer was seen or felt rather. Uh, however, on the image, on the ultrasound image, we see a hypoechoic area on the right purple zone that's lateral. And we see that corresponding here. And indeed, that was the, that was the cancer. Uh, it was not palpable because it was too far lateral, but it was actually seen on ultrasound. Now, a cancer has to have a lot of fibrous stroma like that in order for it to be palpable. Uh, and that's relatively unusual in the cancers that are detected now with PSA screening. Um, now, another feature to keep in mind, here's a small focus of cancer in the prostate, in the peripheral zone, you see the normal glandular tissue on either side of it. Uh, this I show this to, to demonstrate the point that it's only the core of the cancer that you can really visualize on things like ultrasound or even sometimes with MRI. Uh, but all these little areas of cancer that extend out beyond that, like little tentacles, uh, cannot, cannot reliably be detected. So uh, whenever you see a cancer on the, the imaging modalities, you're basically seeing the core, and it's generally, usually, not always, usually much larger than what it appears to be. Uh, this shows a prostate cancer with reactive stroma. You see this uh, fibroblast, myofibroblastic transformation of the prostatic stroma, as opposed to this cancer here, which is actually, uh, these are both least and eight uh, prostate cancers, but this one, uh, is relatively uh, innocuous in the prostatic stroma. Normal prostatic stroma, no reaction to it. So this one is not likely to be palpable, uh, whereas the one on the left would be. Now, it's important as we compare imaging studies with uh, pathologic specimens that we 
that we um, do a, a, a very careful comparison and sectioning the prostate so these comparisons can be made. Uh, we've done whole mount uh, prostate, prostate uh, preparations since the early 1980s, but uh, many laboratories don't have this capability. And if you don't, then it's important to put the prostate in in a way that you can put it back together, so to speak, as a puzzle. Take the apex off, the bladder neck, and label those separately after the specimen ink. Uh, whatever fits in the standard cassette, that's all you have to do is cut it and put it in the cassette. And this one is too large for that, two standard cassettes. And then as you get higher up in the prostate, more toward the base, the, the prostate gets larger. Uh, but if you go in a sequence that you have, uh, in, in, a, in a sequence that's reproducible and that you always do, uh, this goes uh, starting in the right purple zone counterclockwise around the prostate in a numerical sequence uh, up to the uh, lower third of the seminal vesicles. And this is one such specimen which is cut in this way. You ink one side of it, this happened to be mature chrome, uh, which stays on the tissue after processing so that they always embed, uh, for example, this surface here and that surface here, here down so that you're not cutting the top of this one and the bottom of that one, which are right next to each other. And this shows the slides that were produced and my tracings of where the cancer was in this particular prostate uh, specimen. Uh, and here we see uh, how we put these slides back together. And here we see uh, 15, 16, and 17 going from here around the thing. And it's actually, if you do it properly and you have good sections, you can actually look at this and see this is cancer that's in the uh, anterior horn of the right peripheral zone. Now, prostate cancer is uh, multifocal, another rather unusual feature of prostate cancer compared to other cancers of major organs. Uh, even when they're quite small, they can be multifocal. This gentleman probably was detected because the BPH group drove the PSA, which caused uh, detection of a very tiny and innocuous cancer focus here. And uh, only one was detected. The other focus uh, was showed up that was not detected. Uh, these were clinically insignificant. Uh, in retrospect, now these types of patients would have been uh, followed with active surveillance if they're at least in six or less. Now, another feature of multifocal cancer here, and you can see this tumor here, uh, it's quite large in the left peripheral zone. Uh, this was recognized by the urologist and he actually took a portion of the neurovascular bundle here on that side, whereas he spared the neurovascular bundle on the right side of the prostate. Uh, if you're doing focal therapy, uh, this would be the area that maybe the only area you've detected in the prostate that, that has cancer. Uh, so what about these? Well, these may be just innocuous and maybe the natural history is such that uh, they're really not significant in terms of, of treatment uh, when you're using focal therapy. And if they do become significant over time and follow up, they can be treated separately. Now, a real dilemma of the prostate is uh, when you get one of 12 cores, for example, it's very small focus of cancer uh, in, in, in that biopsy session. Is that the tip of the iceberg? Uh, like shown here on the right, where the cancer is much larger and you barely happen to sample it, or is it in fact a very small cancer? And one way to assess that, of course, is advanced imaging technology, but also repeat biopsy sessions where you concentrate on the area where the cancer was detected in the first biopsy session. And if you don't hit the cancer again, it implies that that cancer focus is quite small. Now, Here's a, another issue which happens in the prostate, and it, and it uh, stems from the fact that prostate cancer is often multifocal and also has these irregular shapes. So if you have a cancer like this on the right side, it's actually a fairly large cancer, even though uh, on the needle core, it will only show two relatively small foci of cancer, just like this one would show the same thing. And so this is how, uh, this is the dilemma about how we quantify cancer in needle biopsy. If you look on the left side, everyone by convention would call this 100% cancer with the cancer shown in a purple color and the benign tissue shown in more of a mauve color. Uh, however, in TUR chips, for example, we do percent surface area, but we don't do that in needle biopsy. We do linear extent. Now, what happens when you have is that diagram I showed you earlier where you have two discontinuous foci on either end of the core? Uh, some folks will actually mention those separately and give two different foci. Other folks, uh, for example, the Hopkins group, uh, they consider this perhaps all one big cancer and uh, 
they measure the benign tissue and the cancer length in between to give a total length of cancer. So it's important to know how your pathologist is doing that um, as you look at the data in terms of uh, your correlation with imaging and also determining what to do with the patient. Um, prostatic cancer invasiveness uh, is, uh, of course, the uh, very important thing in terms of determining prognosis. And in our studies early on, if prostate cancer was confined to the prostatic stroma, not beyond the normal glands of the prostate, uh, those patients, nearly all of them, had no issues at all in follow up, even ones that were relatively large tumors and high grade. That's very unlike any other organ where it has to be invading into the capsule in this case or into the adjacent adipose tissue in order to uh, uh, develop metastatic potential. But when you have positive lymph nodes, essentially always in my experience, you have extraprostatic extension to some extent. So this is important for the pathologist to look carefully for. Um, by the way, there is no true prostatic capsule, but it's an area more fibrous than muscular. Uh, it's not like a kidney where you can strip the capsule off. This is a component part of the integrate prostate. But there is a layer here which is more fibrous than muscular. There is a little bit of smooth muscle in there. We, we term that the capsule, which you see well posteriorly and posterior laterally, but really not in any other area of the prostate. Um, we see the prostatic stroma is more red here. In this particular cancer, uh, it's what we call level zero. It's, it's, uh, it's cancer within the stroma, but not outside the confines of where the normal glands are situated. If it's into, into the uh, capsule, it's level two. And some of those cases, we do see uh, recurrence. And then if it's into the loose fibro or real or adipose tissue in the uh, outside the prostate, then that's level three or focal or established extraprostatic extension. And finally, another very significant thing in determining prognosis is the, is the seminal vesicle involvement by prostate cancer. Uh, it's a diagram that we studied in back in the early 90s uh, and define the relationships of how cancer gets to the seminal vesicles from the prostate itself. As it turns out, about 80% of the time, the cancer in the prostate here grows up the ejaculatory duct complex. And when it does so, it involves both seminal vesicles fairly much routinely. On the other hand, the type 2 uh, can either go across the base of the prostate, type 2A, or outside the prostate and then into the seminal vesicles, type 2B. Uh, and in that case, it, it typically is unilateral seminal vesicle involvement. And finally, there's the uh, type 3, which is the discontinuous focus shown here for uh, explanation or, or for clarity. Uh, but typically what happens is you'll have a cancer here, there'll be a whole mouth section with no cancer, and then all of a sudden, uh, next section of the seminal vesicles will show tumor. That's called type three. That's the most unusual uh, of, the, of the three types. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. And, uh, if there are questions, uh, I'll answer as, uh, as a live person rather than a recording. Thank you.